I'm personally amazed at all your stamina. You're still awake. Sure I wouldn't be if I was in your place and you were up here. I want to talk this afternoon in the first session about the subject of criticism. Criticism is part of the price tag of leadership. Leaders are always liable to be surrounded with criticism. And we need to know how to handle it. We need to know, first of all, why it's there. And knowing why it's there, we need to know how to handle it. But we need to get accustomed to it because we will never, ever avoid it. The criticism that's easiest to handle is the, the stuff that comes from opponents because that can uh, make us realize we're in the front trenches and the enemy's against us and we stir ourselves for battle and so on. That's not too bad. We can manage to get through with that. When it comes from other leaders, we can put that down to jealousy or, or whatever. We can have a reason for that. When it comes from our own side, that's the hardest of all. Particularly if it comes from the very people who encouraged us to take leadership up in the first place. It smacks of disloyalty, doesn't it? When suddenly they become our most vociferous critics. I want us to see <clears throat> why criticism arises. It's, it's very important, I think, to understand this. Firstly, Criticism is there because leaders are always changing things, and change is uncomfortable. If leaders are doing their job properly, they're always change agents. And change is stressful. Even change for the better, we discover, in, in, brings some levels of stress. So the people who introduce the changes are the natural target for people's reactions, and they criticize because they're uncomfortable. I don't like change. Secondly, <clears throat> criticism is there because leaders are dealing with the future, and other people cannot see the future as clearly as you can. Moreover, because you're dealing with the future, the present is always incomplete. So there is real and valid criticism that people can direct towards it. And understand clearly that is valid criticism. There are things that have to be improved. There are things that still have to be done. There are things that we overlook from time to time. Things are half finished. The problem is that if you get to the stage where things are finished and everything's tidied up, if the leader's doing his job, he's over the next hill. And again, there are things that's half finished because everything is on the way, you see. And because of that, people can very easily point the finger and say, what about this? Why not this? And so on. Thirdly, criticisms arise simply because people cannot see the future as clearly as the leaders can. Therefore, there's uncertainty and danger in their minds sometimes when they look at the dim and distant and mysterious future. Don't expect them to see the future as clearly as you can. If they can see the future as clearly as you can, they will be the leaders and not you. Your role is to point direction in the future, and their uncertainty and their lack of clarity can very, very often um, make them critical. Fourthly, many times people do not have the information at hand that the leaders have. Leaders position themselves at the core, the, the hub rather, of the communication network. So they have access to fuller information than other people have, and people are therefore many times drawing conclusions from inadequate data. And they're, they're making criticisms that really are not supported by the fact. But remember, they don't have the data that you have. Moreover, they haven't spent the time thinking about it that you have. One of the problems with uh, presenting vision to people, I discover uh, the mistakes we made many times, that after you've struggled with something for six months or a year or whatever, got everything clear, one presentation and you expect people to catch up intellectually, to catch up emotionally, catch up spiritually in one statement, it's impossible, see. May need to have to go back many times to tell it until I get it clear. And, in, and drawing conclusions from inadequate data can make, uh, uh, can be the source of, of uh, uh, criticism. Furthermore, sometimes leaders are withholding data because that gives them access to more power. 
And from time to time, <clears throat> in fact, many times, perhaps you find leaders don't tell it the way it is. They tell some of it. They think, well, that's enough for you to, to understand. There are other things that we know that you don't know, and somehow that uh, supports the, the leader's power position. And they wonder why people are, uh, fall into criticism. Number five, criticism arises because in difficult times the vision is likely to wane. And in difficult times, problems and obstacles seem more powerful and more compelling than the goal. Therefore, people complain, grumble, criticize. As I said before, you ought to read many times the story of Moses leading the children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. I counted at least 14 times in, uh, in that journey. Uh, Israel complained, moaned, grumbled, wanted to go back to Egypt, were ready to stone Moses one time. Even his own brother and sister turned against him. And single-handed, Moses kept the nation on track. Remember, in difficulties, that that's when leaders come into their own. Leaders are made for bad times, not the good times. In the good times, you're almost superfluous. In the bad times, it's when you come into your own. And you're not entitled to extra kudos because you handle the bad times well. That's your job, understand. But when things get bad, uh, that's when people tend to lose heart. And when people lose heart, when people lose courage, you have to be the ones who give them the courage, see. When people lack confidence that things are going to succeed, where are they going to get that confidence from? They've got to get it from you, see. That's why the inner state, the inner heart, the confidence, the courage of leaders is all important, because when people are, un are discouraged, the leaders have to be the ones who encourage them. Remember the time when... Uh, uh, David was out fighting the Philistines, and the, Philist the Amalekites sacked the town of Ziklag, carried away all the wives and families of his, of his men. David and his, and his men came back, and everything had been lost. Says they read to stone David, they blamed him for it. You know what it says? David encouraged himself in his God. That's wonderful. David dug down inside himself, dug down to the root of his faith in God, and found the courage that was needed to give courage to those despairing men set them on track to get their families and their possessions back. Okay. Number six, sometimes people see genuine dangers and obstacles that leaders don't see. Leaders who are concerned with a long-term vision, with the goal out there, with the target they're shooting for, can sometimes overlook a tank trap that's right in front of their feet and step into it in case less, less somebody cries out, watch out. And sometimes criticism is directed towards genuine dangers that are there that leaders have overlooked. Number eight, leaders handle power. And power carelessly used can wound people. And sometimes the criticism that comes, comes out of hurt because people have been wounded by the careless use of power by, by leaders. Sometimes, indeed, that hurt is, is, is uh, unavoidable. If two people have their whole heart and mind set on a particular job and only one of them can get the job, one of them is going to be hurt if he doesn't get the job. There's nothing can be done about uh, the existence of that hurt, but we need to know uh, what needs to be done to bind that up, to restore that person's self-esteem and so on. But power carelessly used can be very damaging and very, very hurtful. Number nine, power appears to be glamorous and exciting to those who don't have it or those who desire to have it and don't have it. Therefore, it can breed jealousy and envy uh, amongst people who would like to be in power positions but uh, have been passed over. Number 10, it is very much easier to criticize than to initiate. Therefore, criticism is a soft option for people who need to have something to say or something to do about, uh, about what's going on. A marvelous little book by Gene Edwards, uh, The Tale of Three Kings, little classic. 
says uh, somewhere in it, the ability to see faults is a cheap and common gift. You don't need to be a prophet to see faults. Lots of people can see faults. It's very easy to criticize. And number 11, criticism is also an easy option because a person does not need to prove their competence. If I criticize something, then I give, I'm giving the impression that I could have done it better than you did. But I don't ever have to put that to the test. So it's very easy to, to, to criticize. Now for these, and probably for other reasons, you've got to uh, reckon on the fact that, that around your life and around your head they're going to fly at regular intervals whole bursts of criticism. Sometimes from the people that you depend on most, sometimes the people whose good opinion you prize most can be your sternest critics. Okay, if that's going to be there, then we need to know how to handle it. First point. Don't reject it out of hand. With whatever spirit the criticism is aimed at you, don't just reject it out of hand. Now, leaders have to be able to carry the day against negative feedback like criticism. If they're going to be stalled by criticism, they're going to get nowhere. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean to say that automatically our first response towards criticism is to be to reject it. That leads very easily to arrogance uh, that we saw is a signpost on the way to deception. Even ill-advised criticism at least has the healthy effect of keeping our feet on the ground. Uh, and saving us from the sin of arrogance. Secondly, don't be discouraged by it. Critic criticism can easily sap leaders' courage and confidence, particularly if it comes from people whose good opinion is valuable to them. So don't allow criticism to discourage you. Thirdly, don't be demoralized by it. Demoralization is a step further down the track from discouragement. Demoralization is when people are so demoralized that they use any option to get off the hook, sometimes unethical options. And we've got to, we've got to watch that. Number four, don't be ruled by it. If you make short-term adjustments to still criticism, then you're going to be wavering all over the place. You, uh, uh, you adjust your policy because this lot here criticizes it, and now you evoke a criticism from those people who agreed with your policy the first time, you make another adjustment, then everybody criticizes you because they see that you can't uh, keep a policy on course on your own principles. You just... Uh, swaying with the, with the tide of opinion. So don't be ruled uh, by criticism. Fifthly, and this is the most important one for leaders, don't personalize it. Don't take it as being a personal rejection of you as a leader. What leaders are sometimes liable to do is to take criticism as being a personal attack on them and to take personal affront against the people who voice those criticisms. One of the best ways I discover to, uh, to avoid that is to ask for it. Uh, to say to people, if you can help us to make a better decision than we've made, we want to hear from you. I remember some years ago in our church when we moved from government by an eldership to uh, a church council, uh, uh, elected by the church, and the elders being part of that uh, council, we had to learn to uh, move by consensus with a body of people numbering about 22 or 23. Now, you can do it in a very unstructured way if you've just got a group of half a dozen or so, but to move with uh, a body of 22 or 23, you need to learn how to do it. And I remember one of the, one of the rules we made and proved to be, it quite, seems quite simplistic to say, it proved to be enormously liberating, we, we made, the, made the point that when we come together, no decision is final. If, if next week or next meeting we can make a better decision, 
then we're going to make a better decision. And somehow that let people off the hook of having to defend a stated decision forever afterwards or admit failure. If you decide beforehand, well, we can revise our decision, get more information, make a better decision, we'll do that. It was a very, very freeing thing. And I recommend that leaders embrace that and uh, leaders uh, say that. Well, this is our decision, it's the best one to date, but if more information or if you can give us some input that will help us to make a better decision, then we'll make it. It can uh, diffuse a lot of the offence that sometimes uh, criticism carries. Always address criticism on its objective merits. Not focus on who said it, not focus on the spirit behind it, but on what it actually says. Because even a wrong motive is not sufficient grounds to reject criticism uncritically. So examine it. And sixthly, try to discover the reason behind the criticism before you can, you can respond properly to it, you need to know uh, what's been behind it. There can be these amongst other possibilities. Firstly, it comes out of fear of change or fear of the future. And what's needed is for leaders to reassure people. They're afraid and they need basically reassurance. It may come out of misunderstanding, mistake, or miscomprehension. People have uh, reacted out of inadequate understanding. What they need is more information, more explanation, more enlightenment. It may come because people have lost heart or have become discouraged then they need to be encouraged, give them encouragement. It may come out of a, an expression of hurt or woundedness. If leaders have been at fault in causing that woundedness or that hurt, then they need to acknowledge their fault, ask forgiveness, and bind up the wounds. Other times, as I said before, hurt may be unavoidable, still needs to be recognized and a uh, person helped to get over it. Sixthly, it may be a diversion or a profitless dispute. In those cases, the criticism needs to be refuted. Otherwise, people's energies are unnecessarily taken up with trying to find answers to it. And finally, it may be because of a wrong attitude or a wrong spirit or a wrong motive in the people who are uh, criticizing, such as envy, jealousy, contention, or divisiveness. These things need to be opposed. But we should be very, very wary of classifying criticism as being wrongly motivated until we're certain. The uh, understanding of even our own motivation is, uh, is very uncertain. And we need to be wary about uh, uh, criticizing other people's motivations. Sometimes criticism comes from wrong perception. Now, there's something here I'd like you to have a look at. When there's an event out here, the first thing that happens is that we have a certain perception This event may be a policy or a, a leadership decision uh, or a goal or whatever. There is a certain perception. That perception is, is uh, affected individually by the content of our mind, our conscious mind and our unconscious mind. It affects the way we perceive things. See, we have a mind which patterns information. And we perceive things 
in a way that's affected by our past history, our past experience, and so on. So in this room today, I've been making single statements to you all. There's been perceptions. We shared our perceptions as to what's going on. You'd find they'd be vastly different, depending on our past experience. But it's also affected by our motivational pattern. What I mean by that is this. <clears throat> Some people are motivated, for, for example, to meet needs. And they see needs arising where other people don't see them, just because that's part of their motivation. Some people <clears throat> are motivated to respond to a challenge. So where some people see that event as a great obstacle, great difficulty, these people would see it as a, as a stimulating challenge, see. Now if leaders are presenting a challenge to people whose perception of that, of that thing is not a challenge, it's an obstacle or a difficulty or a crisis, then their reactions are going to be very different. You understand what I'm saying? The way, the way, we're, the way, we're, mo the way we're patterned uh, affects the way we perceive things. You get some people, for example, who are built so they need time to make up their mind. They need preparation time. They're not comfortable unless they've got adequate time to decide what they're going to do before they face that situation. Now, people like that who are faced with sudden changes in policy, sudden changes in direction, will be disoriented. You know, they're... Uh, they're, they're not ready, they're not, they need time. Now, hang on a bit, hang on a bit. Now, let's take more time over this. See? Now, that's the, way, that's the way they're built, see. And you can't change that. So different perceptions will affect the way in which we react or understand a policy or a, or a, a, a course of action that's in front of us. Secondly, however, our perceptions ultimately go to our will and that decides what our response is going to be to this, this event. And again, our responses are affected at this level by our motivational pattern. Have you ever noticed that sometimes somebody may come to, to the office in the morning and you've got a new uh, a task turned up and you say to them, look, something new's just turned up. We've never done it before. Uh, drop what you're doing and have a go at this. Now, some people are really turned on by that. That's marvellous. I mean, let's get at it, see. Other people, you say exactly the same thing to them and I say, Why? I like doing what I'm doing now, see. They don't want to start all over again and go through the learning curve to, to, to tackle something new. Two people, same event, totally different responses to it. See. And we've got to reckon, uh, reckon on it. That's why it's necessary, I believe, to know our people and understand their responses. Otherwise, their reaction sometimes would be a great mystery. You, you, know, you get some people who wake up in the morning, uh, Monday morning, and they know they've got a pile of work on their desk waiting for them, and that turns them on. I mean, I mean let's get at it. That's, that's marvellous. It's going to be a real good day today. Other people pull the blankets over their head and think, well, can I have a sickie today? Uh, because the whole thing's so daunting, see. Same circumstances, different reactions. You notice you get some people and you give them a job and they will say to you or indicate to you, tell me exactly what you want me to do. Now spell it. I want exact, tell me what you want and I'll do it, see. And so you give them a detailed job description, they're perfectly happy, see. You go to the next person and say, oh, this is what I want you to do. Now listen carefully. I'll give you a very clear description exactly what I want you to do. Before you're halfway through, they say, well, if you know all about it, go and do it yourself. See, if I'm supposed to do it, tell me what you want and let me do it my own way. See, same event, different reactions. <clears throat> and knowing people and knowing the way they're made is, uh, is a critical uh, uh, necessity, I think, in terms of, uh, of using people to write. But it's also one of the reasons why there's a lot of criticism around that sometimes is misunderstood. Okay? Now sometimes the criticism, well the criticism should always be treated as objective. 
All right, they're not criticizing you, they're criticizing the policy. It may be a valid criticism, let's have a look at it. Even if it can be refuted, even if it's a silly criticism, well, let's do the person the respect of taking it seriously and explaining why the criticism is not valid. Sometimes, however, it may be a personal attack. It may be aimed uh, personally at the leaders. Here are the important principles. Number one, don't give as good as you get. Don't fight fire with fire. Don't give as good as you get. Don't decide to fight fire with fire. When the spirit behind the criticism is wrong, the only way we can, can confront it is by confronting it in exactly the opposite spirit. So if the criticism is driven by contention, then we need to respond to it with a peaceable spirit. If the criticism is motivated by malice, we need to respond to it in love. If it's motivated by meanness or a petty spirit, we need to respond with generosity. Generosity of attitude, generosity of heart. If what's behind it is pride, we need to respond with humility. If it comes out of arrogance, we need to respond to it with, to it with teachableness, with a teachable spirit. If it comes out of deception, we need to respond with truth. If it comes out of mistrust, we need to respond with faith. In other words, we need to counter the wrong spirit with the right spirit. Secondly, don't let your emotions dictate your responses. Now, our emotions are, are a, a total psychic response to a, to a stimulus that's out there in the environment. Our, our emotions are something that happen to us rather than something you do. They're part of the equipment God has given you. They have, their function is to motivate us. But don't let your responses be, be decided by your, your, your emotions. Let your responses be decided by your principles. See? Specifically, don't speak out of anger or hurt or a wrong spirit or fear. And secondly, don't speak out of self-pity or fall into the sin of self-pity. The poor me syndrome. They're always talking like that to me, always saying these things about me. Poor me. Remember, there are probably other people around you more vulnerable than you are. Your wife and your family, for example. When the leader is criticized, the one who hurts most is generally his wife, his kids. So don't let your emotions dictate your responses. Thirdly, don't become the personal focus of a division. It's particularly important in the church. Don't become the personal focus of a division. Division is rarely, if ever, a satisfactory resolution of a problem or a difference. But if it ever becomes necessary, it should be on the basis of principle, not personalities. Sometimes on the basis of principle or conscience, Groups have to divide because it's not possible for them to live in good conscience uh, with one another's perspective. Sometimes division may be necessary. Sometimes, strangely enough, division, even hurtful division, proves in the long run to be fruitful. I'm thinking when I, when I say that of a church I know, a very big successful church that split painfully three ways. It was very hurtful because families got divided in the process and a lot of hurt. 
over a number of years the, the situation was, was resolved, resolved. But if you number now the number of people who are in those three separate churches, there are at least three times as many as were in the original church before it split. And yet the split wasn't a division, wasn't a, wasn't a, uh, a chosen one. Perhaps it should have been. Perhaps God stepped, stepped in and divided them when they refused to do it voluntarily. But if there is a division, it should be on the basis of principle and accomplished peaceably, never on the basis of personalities. Fourthly, don't allow other people to be attacked through you. That's very important. When criticism is personally focused, don't allow other people to be attacked through you. And finally, when other people are under attack themselves, don't distance them, yourself from them. People to whom you owe loyalty, just because they happen to be under attack. Remember what loyalty means. Loyalty says, I'll be here in the bad times as well as the good. Loyalty says, I'll be for you even if other people are against you. And loyalty says, I will defend you even at risk or cost to myself. And loyalty is an essential quality in the relationship between leaders and people, need between leaders and leaders. And people to whom we owe loyalty, if they're under attack, we must not distance ourselves from that just for our own, own security. Okay, any uh, questions on that? Yeah, I couldn't hear you when you said the one you'd got. Oh, if the teacher criticized him, is it real often? Is the one right after that? I think it was the last point on the coping criticism. Oh, that, that was the last one. Oh. Yeah. Criticism, oh, it's an attractive option because it carries the unspoken impression that I could have done better, but I don't need to prove it. So I criticize what you've done. I'm saying if I was in your position, I'd done better, but I don't need to be in your position and prove that. So criticism is, is actually for us a very attractive option uh, because you can claim superiority uh, thereby without ever having to demonstrate it. Yes, if you're, if, you're, if you're part, say you're, if you're part, of a, you're part of a team and uh, somebody has got a, uh, uh, something against a member of the team uh, and uh, attacks that person through you, uh, so it's not focused on them, but they say something like, uh, you know, I, I, I've got nothing against you, you know, but the kind of people you mix with and, and the sort of things you get involved with, uh, they're highly suspect, uh, or things like that, and sometimes more barbed than that, and not really getting at you, but they're, they're kind of get you on their side to have a go at somebody else who's related to you. Yeah. Sometimes people, it happens between husbands and wives, uh, you know, uh, somebody will, will uh, 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 say something against one partner in a marriage and say, well, you know, I've got nothing against you, you know, I, I, but... Uh, that's what I mean. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty mean way because it means the person's afraid to go and do it themselves, but they uh, want to give you the bullets and hope that you pass them on, pass the message on. Hmm. I remember reading the, uh, the rules that Count Zinzendorf drew up the first Moravian community in Heronhut way back in the 16th or early 17th century. 
And one of the rules was this. If you're in a group of people and some, something is said about somebody who's not there, you're obligated to go to that person and tell them what was being said and who said it. Uh, and I thought oftentimes, you know, that would be, <laughs> that would be uh, a very salutary treatment in some churches with a lot of gossip. Uh, uh, and I, I suppose one of the responses would, would be if, if somebody says something, you know, your uh, presence against somebody, say, well, I must go and share that with them. Can I tell them you said that? Uh, now, I, I believe in passing on gossip if it's good gossip. You know, if you hear something good said against somebody, then pass that stuff on, yeah, but not the other. Any other questions? Yeah. You mean somebody from another church says comes with uh, problems? Or the same organization. Yeah. I, th I think the pastoral, the pastoral uh, person uh, needs to confront both, both sides of the problem. The problem needs to be brought out in, into the open uh, so that both sides of the, of the story are, are heard, uh, preferably in each other's presence. Uh, other, otherwise, you know, you're only getting a you know, partial, uh, a very highly subjective account of what, what was actually said or actually done. So I'm always in favour. I'm, I'm not temperamentally in favour of confrontation. I, you know, I find that difficult, but I'm, I've learned to my cost it's always better to bring it out in, into the open, face the people up with it face to face. See. And a person who does, that, does have some of that against the leader often psychologically needs the support of somebody because they're in the more vulnerable, vulnerable position. See. The leader's in a more powerful position or is perceived to be in the more powerful position. So they need somebody oftentimes to hold the ropes uh, uh, so that uh, you know, there's, a, there's a neutral observer there to, to, to guarantee fairness of the way things handled. Okay, well, let's take a, a break for a couple of minutes and we'll get on to the, <coughs> on to the next session.